Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. You know, I am from Virginia. This program originates in Tidewater, Virginia, Virginia Beach. And uh, I was born in Virginia, and I am proud to be a Virginian. But I tell you, the New York Post had an editorial, I mean, a, a front page that I think personifies what's going on. The headline was, Virginia is for losers. It used to be Virginia is for lovers. Losers. What happened to Virginia? Well, the Democrats are a bunch of liars in Virginia. I hate to say it. And they ran against a man named Ed Gillespie. And they portrayed him as a violent, horrible racist. They had all kinds of advertising, which were not true, very unfounded. And there was a fellow named Mark Herring who was running for attorney general. And he was known as somebody who was for uh, a traditional marriage. And he was a conservative. Okay. So we elect a guy named Northern, who's a doctor. And uh, he goes in as governor. We elect a black gentleman uh, as lieutenant governor. And we elect Mark Herring as uh, attorney general. So Mark Herring's first role when he is attorney general, he said, I will not defend the Defense of Marriage Act. I will not, as attorney general, support that act of saying that uh, marriage is for one man and woman. So all right, he's changed. Uh, the attorney, the uh, lieutenant governor is going along, and everybody thinks he's a nice guy. Then Northern, the governor, comes out, and he says, well, uh, if a baby is born slightly deformed, said, we'll keep him comfortable until such time we make a decision whether we're going to kill him or not. Well, that brought down, you know, outrage from his former school, Eastern Virginia Medical School. So the people released photographs of Northern in blackface with beside a Ku Klux Klan man, and that was on his yearbook page. And so the howls have come all across the country. Northern should resign. So Herring, the, uh, the attorney general, also joins the fray, and he says the governor should step down. And so Democrats all across the country say, we want to get rid of this guy, Northern, because he's an embarrassment to us for showing up in blackface beside a man in the Ku Klux Klan. So Northern has a press conference, and he said, well, I'm not sure it was me in the picture. But first of all, he says, I apologize for doing it. Then he says, I don't think it was me. And everybody just laughs at him. OK. So the attorney, the uh, lieutenant governor, everybody says, well, he'll take over, and he'll be fine. Now it turns out a woman has come forward. He said he uh, molested her and uh, physically assaulted her. So that's up to there. Now the attorney general who has run against the Ed Gillespie on account of racist, he did blackface, and they've got pictures of him. So the three of them together, I mean, everybody's going to call on them to resign. So what happened? Look, there's that picture. Virginia's for losers. The New York, instead of Virginia's for lovers, that's the New York Post. That's on Drudge. All right. So now if they resign, who takes over the Speaker of the House who happens to be a Republican? I mean, it is, it is a comedy of errors. Unfortunately, this is the greatest state. This is the mother of presidents. This is, was the fountain of our, so many of our liberties. And I'm a, a member of this great state of Virginia. And I am embarrassed with all this mess. But I think it's time that the Democrats well, that would be an embarrassment going into the presidential election to have that thing hanging out there. I mean, uh, well, what is the thing they say when you point your finger at someone else, three others are pointing back? Across, that's right, you. Jerry. I mean, it comes right. <laughs> but I mean, they ask for it and they're getting it. You know, they, yeah, I, I don't believe in karma. You know, if you believe in karma, that's what goes around comes around. And boy, I mean, they got some bad karma coming at them right now. So in any event, the drama will continue, and the, the, the nation is making fun of my great state, the mother of presidents, yeah. you know, the home of George Washington. And we live in crazy times. Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. But this is ridiculous, I mean, what they're doing. But I, I, anyhow, it, it's sad, and, and, but somewhat hilarious.
Well, President Trump predicted yesterday that ISIS will lose all of its land in Syria and Iraq by next week. But we've got a report for you now from inside Syria. Our Chuck Holden went right there to northern Syria, and he shows us that ISIS isn't giving up easily. They're using women and children as human shields. And civilians are fleeing from ISIS into the desert. Here's Chuck's report from southern Syria. So I'm now within sight of ISIS last stand in the area of Hajin, right back behind me. Just off to my right is a place called Bagus, where they say the last ISIS fighters are holed up. We've been hearing airstrikes throughout the evening last night into the early morning hours. It sounds like the military has really stepped up its efforts to eradicate the last of these guys. But what that's causing is more people to flee and many of them are injured. And so uh, here at this collection point, those who can make it here have been walking to this point where they are processed by the Syrian Defense Forces and they're then moved to uh, further side inland. This 19-year-old woman is a French citizen who came with her mother to join ISIS when she was only 15. I came in 2015 with my mother and my sister to, to live in the Khilafah. Uh -huh. And after this, I want to escape, but they ask a lot of money, and my family in French, they, they scare to send the money. There is no food, no nothing. No food. No. We, we was living in the tent. No electricity, never electricity, uh -huh. nothing. I want to go back to my country. Buses come every afternoon to take these women and children to a camp several hours away. Any men who surrender are assumed to be ISIS fighters and are taken to a detention facility. Families who arrive too late are forced to spend the night here in the desert. <laughs> the light is almost gone out here and uh, we're still hearing fighting going on a couple kilometers away. but. The more pressing emergency right now is that there are maybe a couple hundred people out here behind me in this just desert. They got dumped off here after escaping from ISIS, but they're gonna have to spend the night out here. Last night it was about 30 degrees and people could die out here. They're, I'm just watching them as they try to prepare for what they know is coming. It's already on below 40, I would say, clear sky. It's gonna be extremely cold here tonight. And there are these holes that were dug in the earth uh, to be used as slit trenches, as, as bathrooms. And what they're doing is going in and cleaning out all the excrement yeah. and throwing it out. And they're, they're gonna sleep in there tonight because it's at least out of the wind. Many of these people are, are injured as well. Um, it's just hard to imagine. We've given away all the blankets we had. I gave away my warm socks. We're trying to figure out a way to help these people as much as we can, but you know it's just a drop in the ocean. And so um, I'm just not sure what else we can do except pray. From the Euphrates River Valley in southern Syria, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Uh, it's not over yet, folks. And uh, we... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of the president and all that, but I do think we cannot pull out. Uh, ISIS is not defeated, and the Turks couldn't wait to get in and start a slaughter. They want to slaughter the Kurds. They want to slaughter the Christians. They want to slaughter the Yazidis, and they wouldn't hesitate. Remember what they did years ago with the Armenians. They slaughtered them. It's a stain on the Turkish uh, uh, conscious and they refuse to have it even brought up. When somebody begins to say, well, look what Turkey did. They don't want it brought up. They'll, they'll you know, they say, we're going to shut you down if you start talking about what we did to the uh, uh, Armenians. And yet they did. And they'll do the same thing to the Kurds, and they'll do the same thing to the uh, Yazidis, and they'll do <clears throat> the same thing to the Christians. We cannot leave that area now. We can't do it. So when the Senate passes a resolution as almost unanimous that we stay that course in that place, the president had better listen. Well, in other news, despite all the bickering in Washington, Republicans and Democrats are coming together today, and that's a heartening news. Charlene Aaron has that. 
That's right, Pat. In Washington today, lawmakers from both sides of the aisle, along with President Trump, will join together to turn to God, marking the 2019 National Prayer Breakfast. Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson spoke with this year's co-chairs to discuss the importance of putting aside their party differences to come together and pray. With the deep partisan divide in our country, Senate Democrat Chris Coons and Republican James Langford are heading up this year's prayer breakfast. They say it's more important than ever to come together to pray. It is a moment that's been set aside for decades to pause, to pray, to reflect, and to be able to challenge each other. And is it, as in most events, it's not just the event itself, it's all the dialogue around it that really makes a lasting impact. The event draws thousands from all 50 states and more than 100 countries. So when I talk to skeptics, and there are many, uh, I had some conversations with uh, folks uh, in my caucus about this yesterday. I say, just give it a try, come and listen. And while the breakfast falls during a tense political time, the senators say they don't plan to focus on any single issue. I don't think we'll have any specific prayers about uh, border security, border walls, border. I mean, look, at the end of the day, um, partly why the National Prayer Breakfast has been an important and enduring institution here in Washington is that despite the changes from Republican to Democrat president's uh, control of Washington, the issue of the day, um, it draws us towards uh, the eternal, towards those things that um, uplift and inspire all of us. Throughout the year, the senators lead a weekly prayer breakfast with about two dozen members. Uh, when we stop and pray for each other and share our spiritual stories with each other of our own journey of faith, uh, it is very moving and quite frankly, it's encouraging. And it's one of those foundational things that's within our democracy uh, that I think people lose track of. I think the hour that we spend every week in prayer together uh, is one of the most important uh, moments of a week here in the Senate. President Trump has also publicly praised Senator Coons and mentioned how they pray together. Senator Chris Coons, who on occasion we disagree, but I actually like him. <laughs> we pray together, right? Uh, that's, that's a good step. Coons described to CBN News a moment when the two were in Delaware to greet the family of a fallen American serviceman. Uh, that, I could tell, was a very uh, challenging and powerful moment for him. The first time um, you are present with a family that has just lost their husband, their son, their father, uh, is very difficult and very powerful. He prayed with the president that day and encourages others to do so, even if they disagree politically. And so um, I'm, you know, I'm glad that he remembers that I'm someone who prays for him. Um, we have very strong policy differences, uh, but that doesn't mean I can't see him as someone um, deserving of and needing prayer. The senators hope that as national and world leaders gather in prayer, there will be unity in focusing on what the Lord leads them to do. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Rabbi Yaquil Eckstein, who worked for decades to develop closer relationships between evangelical Christians and Jews, has died at the age of 67. Media reports said he died at home from heart failure. Chris Mitchell brings us this look at Eckstein's work and the tributes he's receiving. Rabbi Yaquil Eckstein founded the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, better known these days as The Fellowship, in 1983. His goal was to build bridges of understanding between Christians and Jews and to show Christians how to reestablish their biblical connection to the land of Israel and the Jewish people. Now in its 36th year, the fellowship has far exceeded expectations. Not only is the organization a leader in Jewish-Christian relations, it's also helped thousands of Jews around the world escape poverty and anti-Semitism to return to their biblical homeland, Israel, and has funded humanitarian assistance that's touched the lives of millions of Jews worldwide. Tributes to Eckstein poured in on Wednesday, including one from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who said Eckstein worked very hard to benefit the citizens of Israel and to strengthen the connection between the Christian communities and Israel. May his memory be a blessing. And from CBN founder Pat Robertson, who said, words cannot express the sorrow I feel at the untimely passing of my dear friend, Yaquil Eckstein. Yaquil has been a pioneer and champion of Christian Jewish relations for decades. We have worked together on many projects and the success of his organization attests to the compassion that he feels for his fellow Jews 
who suffer in poverty in various parts of the world. I am sure I echo the words of our Lord, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Rabbi Eckstein was 67 years old. Chris Mitchell, CBN News. And Pat, I know that you were a really good friend of his and you appreciated his work. We were very close and uh, I think we gave him the first major contribution to his organization years ago. But, you know, he realized the tremendous pool of, of love that there exists in the evangelical community for the Jewish people. And he realized that that group needed to be involved in the affairs of uh, Israeli people. So he began the Fellowship of Christians and Jews, and uh, along the way, he touched in to the uh, compassion that exists in the evangelical community, and the uh, support of his organization was enormous. But he went into the Russian, went into the places where the poor Jews were. He, he had constant exposure to these suffering people, and the evangelical people were thrilled to be able to support him. So his organization grew and flourished. And uh, as I say, I'm, words cannot describe the sorrow that I feel at his passing, because he was a dear, dear friend, and uh, he will be sorely missed. Terry? You know, we had his daughter on this program as well, and she is a great leader and lovely, and I think will probably carry on her father's legacy. Well, so. I hope so, but it, as I say, but he recognized the, the, the pool, the enormous pool of love that there is in the evangelical community. And I think that the Jewish people were, you know, after Hitler and after the Holocaust and all that, they were suspicious of Christians. They, they didn't believe it. But the evangelicals have reached out along the way to Israel. They've supported Israel in Jewish causes. And Echiel built a bridge uh, extraordinary that would use that pool of love to s support the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. All right.